Well, we have been walk, working our way through Colossians, and this morning we come to Colossians 3. And as we have worked our way through Colossians, I've compared uh, being in union with Christ to becoming a skier. And I have shared this isn't a picture of me, but I often did face plant when I was learning to ski because there were things about me that simply needed to change. There were things that I believed that were simply wrong. For one, as I shared, I was pigeon-toed, which means my toes point inward, which isn't that hard when you're walking, but if you have skis on the end, they tend to cross, and if the skis cross, you tend to face plant. So there's something inherent about me that needed to change. There's also some things that I believed were true that turned out not to be true. I'm like, what is the point of getting a pair of goggles? They're kind of expensive. So instead, I had glasses that tended to freeze up and I couldn't see anything. There was something that I believed to be true that was not true. The Colossians have heard the gospel. They have understood the grace of God and salvation and they have believed. And yet there are things that they don't yet know. There are things about them that need to change. And there are things that they believe that, frankly, are wrong. So these new believers need to more accurately envision Christ's present and coming kingdom so that they can completely convert their heart, their mind, and their will to be in union with Christ. Last week... I spent some time explaining how the Colossian believers were cheating themselves by remaining captive to commonly held God-man theories, or what I call GMTs. A God-man theory is a tightly held belief in the nature of God and man and their ongoing relationship that bypasses God's word, or it circumvents God's word, or it's in contradiction to God's word, but we may hold it to be true. Here are some that we pull out of Scripture. Um, Eat and drink for tomorrow we die, which is a form of fatalism. Um, We see it first in Isaiah 22. Paul brings it up again in 1 Corinthians 15. The idea is that we might as well just enjoy this life as much as we can because who knows, we may die tomorrow. That's a God-man theory. Don't worry about that. Just live for today. That is circumventing God's Word that tells us to be prepared that we could die today and we need to be prepared for eternal judgment. The fathers eat sour grapes and the children's teeth are put on edge. This was the idea that we are actually being um, judged and condemned for the sins of our fathers rather than for our own. And I think um, Ezekiel 18 pretty well puts that to rest, that we'll be judged for our own sins. What are some for our day? God loves you just the way you are. Now, there's a piece of truth in all of these God-man theories, but there's a huge lie that's in them, too. The lie here is that the truth is you don't really need to change. God loves you in spite of who you are, and God will call you to himself, but in that calling, there's going to be a constant call for us to change, to transform, to become more like Christ. People do not change. There's a piece of truth in that. We are a stubborn lot. But the truth is, people do change. If people do not change, then we're in the wrong business. In fact, if people do not change, we just need to kind of sell the church and turn it into a casino because there's, it's pointless for us to be gathering and to be studying God's Word. And then we hear, love wins. A word by Rob Bell, a book by Rob Bell, that declares that basically in the end... God will save everyone. These are God-man theories that simply are bypassing the truth of God's word. So I have to ask myself, are there God-man theories that are limiting my vision, that are slowing me down? And how is God at work in my life clearing my vision so that I can begin to release these God-man theories. Scripture is continuously pointing us to the connection between our thoughts and feelings and how they connect to our speech and our behavior. We read in Matthew 5 about how anger 
and murder are related and lust and adultery are related. These are feelings, desires that come up with within us and they lead to other behaviors and they're all rooted in the fact that we believe something that's not true. Anger, we believe that there should be something very different that's happening to us. God is sleeping, people around us are being mean to us, and we believe that we have a right to be angry at them, and obviously that can lead to murder. But what we're hearing is this connection between thoughts and feelings, our speech and behavior. We read in Matthew 15, what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart. We're getting to the problem. And this is what defiles a person. It's what is inside our heart. And that's where our speech comes from. That's where our actions come from. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person. So it's not okay just to think about it, even though we're not going to do it. This is a PMT. A PMT is a safe thing. A GMT is a bad thing. PMT is a Pastor Mark theory. And this is a Pastor Mark theory on human conduct. And I put this up before, and I want you to see this feedback triangle that is constantly going on in our spirits between our beliefs, our behaviors, and our desires. And behaviors often grow out of beliefs. We may believe something is true, and that affects the way we behave. We may believe something is true, and a desire grows within us. That can be both a good thing and a bad thing. In a bad thing, which is what we're reading about in Matthew 5, there is a belief inside that if I just had this freedom to commit adultery all the time, that I would be happier. That's the belief. So this desire, this lust, this passion for other people grows, and then a behavior develops. I know I can figure out a way to divorce my spouse and pursue something else. It can also grow in a good way. Maybe you don't really believe in the power of the scriptures to change you. But you trust someone and they convince you if you will just read the scriptures every morning for two months, I believe it'll change you. And so you pursue that behavior and what happens? Your belief begins to change. You begin to see the living word coming alive in your own life, and you have a desire, a hunger. So instead of dragging yourself out of bed, there's a huge desire to go and jump into God's word. What I want us to see, though, is this feedback triangle, and it's all floating in a sea of imagination. And this is what's so important. We need to be able to imagine what is actually going on in the world around us, the things we can't see. When we hear the gospel, when we understand the grace of God and salvation and believe in the power of Jesus Christ in us, imagination begins to clear up our vision and correct this feedback triangle. The thought that we have to get angry, we have to pursue our own rights, we have to do whatever we need to to get ahead, that begins to go away. And we begin to understand that it is through Christ that we are saved and Christ is the one who is preparing a future for us. These God-man theories, they restrict, they corrupt our imagination, they limit our vision, they hold us back, they cheat us from knowing the fullness of power in Christ. And they convince us to accommodate wrong beliefs, they convince us to accommodate things about ourselves that need to change. I could just go, you know what? I'm pigeon-toed. I'll just use a snowboard instead. What's the point? I'll never learn to ski. I don't need to ski. I'll just use a snowboard. And my glasses ice over. You know what? I'll just ski on warm, sunny days. You see how limiting this is? You see how you may be able to get by, but you're going to get by in just such a small way compared to what God desires for us in Christ. So as we look at this passage, we want to see how Paul is calling the Colossians to transform your imagination. You need to see things that you're not yet seeing. They need to see how Christ is raising them up. They need to see how they can actually be what is weighing them down. They need to see how Christ is releasing them from 
the things about themselves that are weighing them down. And then I want us all to be able to see this collision that is constantly going on in our imaginations. So, see how Christ is raising you up. Friends, I really believe the battle is being won or lost right here. This is where the battle is won or lost. Who will have control of your imagination? Where do you go to fill your head with what will be tomorrow? Believers must hear and understand and believe in the present and the coming kingdom of Christ. Paul tells the Colossians that you were also raised with Christ through faith in the powerful working of God. They hear that and there can be some confusion. Well, I know there are things that have happened to us, but I'm still struggling. So what is it that's already happened to these Colossian believers? What is it that is happening? What will happen? Is it true that they have been raised or is it that they are being raised or is it that they will be raised on the final day? Yes, those are all true. Are they already saved or are they in this process of being saved or will they be saved on the final day? Yes, those are all true. Is it that they have already died to the self or is the self being crucified or will they finally die to themselves on the final day? Yes, again, those are all true. There's a process that has begun in all who believe that is continuing. Will that process be completed? It depends on what we believe. Do you have faith? Believing a process will be completed when, in fact, it is ongoing does require faith. A couple weeks ago, I spent over four hours on the phone with Xfinity. The fact that you laugh means that you don't believe Xfinity any more than I believe Xfinity. They made promises, and I think I genuinely was hurting the person on the phone that was saying, don't you believe that I can credit your account? And I said, I believe you want to, but I don't believe you can, because the other six people were not able to either. Who is it that is telling you that this process will be completed? It's the Spirit of Christ. And I think, for me, my imagination has really helped in these first four verses if we'll take a little bit of time and parse out what is being said. So we begin with the first two verses to see how Christ is raising us up. If then you have been raised, this is a simple past. It means it's something that's begun in the past. It doesn't comment on whether it's completed or it's ongoing. And I'm going to share with you that it's ongoing. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek. This is a present command. Now, you guys, you've had English. You just got to go back and realize that what Kerry King was teaching is important stuff. And you need to hold on to it. Right now, in the present, there's a command that we need to seek the things that are above. That's where Christ is. And there's a reason for that, because that's where our life is. We're connected there. That's where Christ is seated right now at the right hand of God. So set your mind, again, a present command. We're seeking and we're setting our mind on things above, not on the things of the earth. Why? Because our lives are connected to the present and coming kingdom of Christ. They're not connected to the present promises of the kingdoms of this world. The present and coming kingdom of Christ is something that cannot fail because of who has promised us. The present and promised kingdoms of this earth will fail because of who is promising us. So we need to set our minds. minds. We need to root our beliefs and our desires in the work of Christ. The passage goes on. For you have died. This is a simple past again in the command. You have begun to die. You are being killed. 
and your life is hidden. Now, this is a perfect past. It's complete. It's already done. Your life is already hidden in Christ. This isn't going to change. Your life is there. It's hidden in Christ. That is something that's completed. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will appear with him in glory. Believers have died. The focus now needs to be on what is above, not what is here. And our lives are hidden in Christ. They've been hidden, but they've also been made known. What does that remind you of? It reminds you of the gospel. The gospel was hidden, and then it was made known. Your future is hidden now to the world. People may not understand why you do what you do or why you don't do what you don't do because your future is hidden now to the world, but it will be made known because Christ, who is your life, the one that you're connected to, when he appears, all believers will join him in the kingdom. They're like, I get it now. I see it. It'll be seen for all eternity. This is why I say the battle is won or lost here in our imagination. If we are struggling to see that our lives right now as believers are connected eternally to Christ and his present and his coming future kingdom, then we're going to struggle. We're going to be more susceptible to our our imaginations being corrupted and destroyed by things that build kingdoms here on the earth. Or things that protect us here on the earth. We get so fearful of all that is going on. Who will inform us on our imagination? Are they proven believable? What are you seeing in your future? From where does our hope come from? Does it come from the fact that our life is hidden with Christ? The picture of the present and coming kingdom of Christ sharpens as we grow in our knowledge of Christ. Our beliefs strengthen, our behaviors transform, our desires purify. This is the process of being raised, of being saved, of being crucified. We need to see how Christ is raising us up. And we need to see how we can be weighing us down. When we had the groundbreaking ceremony of the equipping center, for a reason unbeknownst to me, and a decision that was remarkably foolish, I was in charge of the celebration. (laughs) And we had this idea of uh, letting go of balloons, and then you realize that those balloons all go somewhere, and it's usually not good. So we ended up with one balloon. This is the idea. We're going to have one balloon... This was my idea. One balloon, and it'd have this very small bag on it, and it would be filled with seeds. And we would release the balloon, and the balloon would go out, and it would take those seeds and carry them and scatter them across the face of the earth. I mean, that's a pretty good idea, right? (laughs) Well, there was an issue. There was an issue. Because I went and I got the balloon, and at 8 o'clock before the service... And I brought it back, and I put it in my office, and I put the seeds on it. I tied it all together. When I went in at noon, the balloon was on the ground. This is not a good optic at all. What am I going to do? I didn't realize that helium actually leaks out of a balloon. Do you guys know that? If you knew that, you probably should have been in charge instead of me. But it was leaking out. So what am I going to do? I don't have more helium. That's a problem. So I took out a lot of the seeds. And I took out enough seeds, then it would float again. That's not that great of an optic. Now, no one knew that, but I knew that. I knew that if there wasn't enough rise in that balloon, if we are not sufficiently filled by the Spirit, we're just not going to be able to carry that many seeds out and scatter them across the face of the earth. Paul is addressing them with things that are weighing them down. They are letting their desires overrule the Lord God. And Paul tells them to put to death, again, a simple command, this has already begun, but you need to complete this process. Put to death what is 
earthly, what is connected to the kingdoms of this world. The promises that you're getting from this world just simply aren't true. Put to death what is earthly in you. And the focus that Paul has here is a big one for them. It's not the only one. It's their sexual immorality. Sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, that the heart is longing for something else, covetousness, longing for someone else. All of this is idolatry. They're bowing down before their sexual desires, and this is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. They had an issue. They had an issue that they still had huge desires in their heart that they were not addressing. What are we supposed to do with desire? It's clear in James 1 that each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. We have desire within us that is tempting us to sin. Desire, when it's conceived, when we follow it to a behavior, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's fully grown, will bring forth death. Paul says in Romans 13, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Simple past, it's something that's begun, needs to continue. Put on the Lord Christ. Jesus Christ, and make no provision for the flesh to gratify those desires. There's a call here to do something about desire. The gospel has the power to master desire. Now, I will tell you that there are some individuals and there are some desires that you can pray once, and that desire goes away. Honestly, that is not my experience with most desires. It takes time. It takes many prayers. It takes other people praying for you. It takes a, a willingness to grow in your hatred for sin and your love for Christ. Appreciate this quote from Barbara Duguid in Extravagant Grace. The gospel leads us to deep grief over our sin combined with great joy in our Savior, but never to bold and rampant enjoyment of sin. We're not free to continually hold on to these desires. And sexual desire was an issue. It was a fertile ground for God-man theories from the very beginning. Because as soon as the serpent said, Hath God really said... It's not long before we have the first murder, and it's not long before Lamech took two wives. Why not? Has God really said a man shall leave his father and mother and cling fast to his wife? Why not cling to two? Or as many as you choose, Genesis 6, 2, the sons of God took as their wives any they chose. The issue in Colossae was that pagan worship held that sexual encounters were a part of worship. So they had temple prostitutes. That was their God-man theory. God-man theories today may insist upon a level of sexual freedom. They may insist upon redefining the purpose and the place for physical intimacy. They begin to redefine gender itself. These are all God-man theories that are bypassing God's words. Paul says that we need to put such practices to death because they're limiting our vision, our ability to see. They're stifling our imagination. They're weighing us down. They're putting something in the place of the Lord God. They're idols. Can believers actually kill sexual desires and behaviors that are serving as idols? Well... What is it that they are seeing in Christ? Where is their hope in Christ? We go to verse 7. In these two you once walked. This is what you used to do when you were living in them. So that is a perfect past. It's completed. That's where you were living. But that is no longer your identity. Your identity is now that you're living in Christ. You're in union in Christ. You're connected in Christ. That's who you were. This is who you are. Believers now need to live for the kingdom of Christ, not for the kingdoms of this world. Paul is calling believers to become what they now are and no longer linger in what they once were. It's the same thing that he tells the Corinthians. Do you not know that the 
righteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. So no longer connect yourselves to the unrighteous. Don't be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. That's what you were, but your identity is different now because you were washed, sanctified, justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of our God. Paul consistently is calling believers to become what we are and no longer linger in what we were. But as I said, that is not always easy that can be a slow process but the call is to continue putting it to death the old self needs to die repeated failure does not mean that you're unsaved or that God is tired of you or even that God is disappointed it does mean that he has called you to a difficult struggle and that he will hold on to you in all of your standing and falling and bring you safely home. That is the process of being raised, of being saved, of the body dying to self. So, see also how you can be weighing yourself down by letting our love for ourselves overrule our love for our neighbor. They had come to talk the way their friends on social media talked. And Paul said, you can't talk the way your friends on social media talk. You need to talk differently. Now you must put them all away. Again, something that has begun that needs to continue. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie in the present to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed right now in the knowledge after the image of its creator. There's a lot in this passage. Paul is telling them it's time to take off, to strip off these rags that you have been wearing. The focus here seems to be rooted in speech, speech that flows out of their beliefs. Their beliefs that they need to stand up for themselves. Their beliefs that they need to use their words to control the people around them, to get the people around them to do the things that they think they should be doing. There's a war that is going on within us, a war for our tongues, for our hearts, for our words. How are we going to use our words? Are we going to use our words to worship the Lord God? Are we going to use our words to build up the people around us? Are we going to use our words to tear down those people around us and build up ourselves. Anger is a problem. We become angry at how we're being treated. We become angry and want to incite revenge. We can rage, nurture hatred, slander another, wanting others to know just how bad they are disparage another, exaggerate. I don't really know that six people promised me that refund on Xfinity, but I know that's what I told her. I think I was exaggerating. That means I'm bearing false witness. Why? To gain an advantage. Why did I think it was okay to lie to her? Because I wanted to gain an advantage. I wanted her to feel really sorry for me, and then maybe she would follow through, which she didn't, but maybe she would. Our words grow out of these earthly beliefs and earthly desires. What is it that they are seeing when they look upon Christ? Where is their hope? Are they willing to put off the old self and put on the new self? That is a process that they are going through each day. A renewal that is happening in the present each day. Are they ready to understand that they have been cut free from the line of Adam and now they are reconnected to the line of Christ to be renewed. Who's this true for? It's true for everyone. There's not difference between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised. Who you were in your past isn't what determines whether this process 
is going to be completed and how fast it will be completed. There's not barbarians, those that were ignorant, the Scythians, those that were true savages, slave or free. The point is that Christ is all in all because Christ is in us doing this work. Our past is insufficient to weigh us down and prevent the power of Christ from raising us back up. We're not defined by what we were, but who we now are in union in Christ. We need to put our past in its place. It doesn't mean it's not important, but it doesn't have power to rule over us. See how you can be weighing you down and see how Christ is releasing you from you. So this balloon isn't going to raise anybody up because it needs to be filled. It's got to first be filled. Something has to be put in it. The life of Christ isn't just about stripping off the old self. It's about allowing the spirit of Christ to fill us up. Put something else on us. You all have such a clear understanding of Leviticus. If you go back to Leviticus 8 and the picture of the priests coming in and they had to take off their clothes and then Moses would scrub them and clean them, a cleansing, and then they would put something back on. So now they were truly holy. There's a stripping off. There's a putting back on. And this passage now is about putting on. Put on something that's already begun, but it needs to be completed. Put on as God's chosen one, holy and beloved. That is something that's completed. God's love for us is in the past. It's already been done. That doesn't mean he isn't still loving us, but he has proven it through Christ. That's a completed task. You are beloved. You should know you're beloved if we're truly believing in Christ and we're believing God's words. So put on compassionate hearts where we care for other people, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, not putting the self first, but putting other people first, bearing and forgiving. These are present commands, bearing with one another, overlooking those offenses that people just seem happy to do against us. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, you must also forgive. Forgiveness is clearly awarding undeserved grace. If people deserved it, it wouldn't be forgiveness. The idea of forgiveness is we look and we know before God we have no right to be forgiven. It's absolutely unjust. Yet God forgives us. Because of the work of Christ. Because he is putting our sin on him and he is dying in our place. So through your unjust forgiving, when you're willing to forgive people that have truly wronged you, God is painting a portrait of his glory. And people say, well, why did you do that? How can you do that? Well, it's what God has done for me. Powerful, powerful witness. Above all these, put on love which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Just think of love as this overcoat, which is a, can be a good thing. So it's an overcoat that holds the community get together. We're caring for others through our words and deeds. It's the perfect harmony that because of love, because I know the love Christ has for me, and I can extend that love to others. Romans 13 again, owe no one anything except to love each other for the one who loves another is fulfilling the law. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is fulfilling the law. So we're seeing how Christ is releasing us from us and he is ruling our imagination. This is the point I want you to really center in on. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts to which indeed you are called in one body and be thankful. We need to see this eschatologically. We need to see the restoration of all things. We need to see that what now is will not always be. Can we let the peace of Christ rule in our hearts? When you know how this is going to end, there's a remarkable peace. Who is anxious 
about watching a rerun movie. I mean, if you get anxious, I suppose it's because you want to be. But you shouldn't be because you know how it's going to end, provided it ends well. And we know this story. We know how it's going to end. God has clearly established that for us. So why be anxious? Let the peace of Christ. It just gets more exciting. I wonder how God is going to do this. I wonder how he's going to get us through today. Maybe he won't get us through today and we get to leave early. Praise the Lord. And let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. What a glorious picture. The word of Christ is overruling. It's conquering the incredulous self. It says, no, 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 that just can't be. No, 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 that may be for some times, but not this time. And I understand I'm supposed to forgive, but you don't understand what they did. But guess what? That gets overruled because we're being taught, we're being admonished by one another that we need to listen to the word of Christ. And a primary way that happens is through the singing of psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. I will virtually guarantee that there's not one person in here that in two weeks will be repeating any word that I have said to you this morning. But you will be singing and repeating the phrases that were in the hymns that we sang this morning. Because that is what rolls in your mind. That is what deeply teaches us. Singing is how we teach the self. We need to do this all to honor Christ out of thanksgiving to God the Father. So friends, see the collision that is going on right now in your imaginations. We need to see it. What is that collision? The question is, who will rule me? Who should rule me? I mean, this is, this is the jugular. This is what the serpent went for right in Genesis 3. We're not going to try any softball stuff. We'll just go right to the beginning and say, hath God really said, you know, you could be like God knowing good and evil. And then you can rule you. You should be ruling you. You're made in his image. By golly, you're the one that ought to be in charge. That's a God-man theory. Serpent came up with the first one. But he taught us well. We've been coming up with many ever since. But God says something very different. My will will rule you. My will will rule you. You're not that good at ruling yourself. Instead, my will will rule you. And so what you need to see in your imagination is the glory of a benevolent king that is absolutely ruling over you, determining everything, and that you may continue to grow in your love for him, grow in your love for one another, that there's no more sorrow, that there are no more tears. Can we see that? Can we imagine that? Because that's what Scripture is telling us is coming. Do you see that? Are you preparing for that? Friends, the battle is won here. The battle is won in our imagination. Will we be informed by what the words of God are telling us, or are we going to be informed by what we read elsewhere, or what we watch elsewhere, or what we listen to elsewhere? We need to be informed by the words of God. Otherwise, it's no different than listening to an Xfinity operator. They may be telling you what they think will be true, what they hope will be true, but they have no power to make true. What God has said, he knows will be true. Because he is the one that said it, he will surely do it. We can praise him. Let's bow our heads together. Father, we are so thankful that you clearly have opened the future to us, that you have shown us what you were doing. You have told us what will come. Lord, we do not know details, but we know who you are, and we can see what you've already done. Lord, I pray that you would fill our imagination with the glory of what it will be to be in eternity with you forever. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. I invite you to stand as we sing together. Mm -hmm.